Hey everyone, and welcome back to my channel. It's Voice of Persona ASMR. It's been a while. I haven't uploaded in two months, I think. But today, as you can see, I'm all dressed up. It's a special occasion because we are going to be reading through George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood. Yeah. So, for those of you who don't follow the Game of Thrones, currently there is a show on HBO called House of the Dragon, and this is a prequel to the original series. That's what this, uh, that's what this show, this is what the show is based on, is what I'm trying to say. This book is where the show's source material comes from and so I figured it would be cool to come on here and read a little bit from the book about a chapter or so I don't know how long it is but could read a little bit from the book you guys can sit back relax and relieve a little bit of stress this should be relatively spoiler free if you're caught up with the show um, I believe the beginning of the book takes place before the show if I'm not mistaken so I've been told so you probably won't have to worry about spoilers, but if you're a little bit skittish, maybe don't watch this video just in case. But anyway, this is George R. R. Martin's Fire and Blood. Let us begin. As you can see, I'm using the lapel mic because the blue Yeti is too big for me to actually have in front of my face and read from the book at the same time. So I'm not able to do that. But anyway, um, immediately as I open the book, which is really cool, I'm greeted by this illustration already. So kind of like setting up what uh, the characters look like. Um, and, you know, just establishing sort of a, a frame of reference for you to have in your mind. So, let's begin. Sit back, relax, kick your feet up, close your eyes, whatever you want to do. Take it easy. And let's just hang out for a little while. Let me read you a bedtime story, essentially. Okay, so, this is Aegon's Conquest. The maesters of the citadel who keep the histories of Westeros have used Aegon's conquest as their touchstone for the past 300 years. Births, deaths, battles, and other events are dated either AC, after the conquest, or BC, before the conquest. True scholars know that such dating is far from precise. Aegon Targaryen's conquest of the Seven Kingdoms did not take place in a single day. More than two years passed between Aegon's landing and his old town coronation. And even then, the conquest remained incomplete. Since Dorne remained unsubdued, sporadic attempts to bring the Dornish men into the realm continued all through King Aegon's reign and well into the reigns of his sons, making it impossible to fix a precise end date for the wars of conquest. Even the start date is a matter of some misconception. Many assume wrongly that the reign of King Aegon the First Targaryen began on the day he landed at the mouth of the Blackwater Rush, beneath the three hills where the city of King's Landing would eventually stand. Not so. The day of Aegon's landing was celebrated by the king and his descendants, but the conqueror actually dated the start of his reign from the day he was crowned and anointed in the starry sept of Old Town by the high septum of the faith. Uh, this coronation took place two years after Aegon's landing, well after all three of the major battles of the wars of conquest had been fought and won. Thus, it can be seen that most of Aegon's actual conquered, fought, uh, conquering, excuse me, took place from 2 to 1 BC before the conquest. 
The Targaryens were of pure Valerian blood, dragon lords of ancient lineage. Twelve years before the doom of Valeria, at 114 BC, Aenar Targaryen sold his holdings in the Freehold and the lands of the long summer and moved with all his wives, wealth, slaves, dragons, siblings, kin, and children to Dragonstone, a bleak island citadel beneath a smoking mountain in the narrow sea. At its apex, Valeria was the greatest city of the known world, the center of civilization. With its, within its shining walls, two score rival houses vied for the power and glory and court and council rising and falling in an endless, subtle, oft savage struggle for dominance. The Targaryens were far from the most powerful of the dragon lords, and their rivals saw their flights to the most, uh, to, saw their flight to Dragonstone as an act of surrender, as cowardice. But Lord Aenar's maiden daughter, Daener, uh, Danis, Danis? Not sure. Danis, known forever afterward as Danis the Dreamer, had foreseen the destruction of Valeria by fire. And when the doom came 12 years later, the Targaryens were the only dragon lords to survive. Dragonstone had been the western outpost, westernmost outpost of Valerian power for two centuries. Its location athwart the gullet gave its lords a strange, uh, a stranglehold on Blackwater Bay and enabled both the Targaryens and their close allies, the Valerians of Driftmark, a lesser house of Valerian descent, to fill their coffers off the passing trade. Valerian ships, along with those of another allied Valerian house, the Celtigars of Claw Isle, dominated the middle reaches of the narrow sea whilst the Targaryens ruled the skies with their dragons. Yet even so, for the best part of a hundred years after the Doom of Valeria, rightly named Century of Blood, House Targaryen looked east, not west, and took little interest in the affairs of Westeros. Gaiman Targaryen, brother and husband to Danis, the Dreamer, followed Aenar the Exile as Lord of Dragonstone and became known as Gaiman the Glorious. Gaiman's son Aegon and his daughter Elena ruled together after his death. After them, the lordship passed to their son Magon, his brother Aerys, and Aerys's son Alex, Balin, and Damien. Or Damon. Damon? I think it's Damien. Not the same character, Damon. The last of the three brothers was Damon, whose son Aaron then succeeded to Dragonstone. The Aegon, who would be known to history as Aegon the Conqueror and Aegon the Dragon, was born on Dragonstone in 27 BC. He was the only son, the second child of Arian, Lord of Dragonstone, and Lady Valena of House Valerian, herself half Targaryen on her mother's side. Keeping up yet? Am I losing you a little bit? Aegon had two true-born uh, true siblings, an elder sister, Visenya, and a younger sister, uh, Rhaenys. It had, it had long been the custom amongst the dragon lords of Valeria to wed brother to sister to keep the bloodlines pure, but Aegon took both his sisters to bride. By tradition, he would have been expected to wed only his older sister, Visenya. The inclusion of Rhaenys as a second wife was unusual, though not without precedent. It was said by some that Aegon wed Visenya out of duty and Rhaenys out of desire. All three siblings had shown themselves to be dragon lords before they wed. Of the five dragons who had flown with Aenard the Exile from Valeria, only one survived to Aegon's day, the great beast called Valerian, the Black Dread. The dragons Vagar. Vagar and Meraxus were younger, hatched on Dragonstone itself. I'm sure I'm butchering some of these names, by the way. I apologize, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just rolling with it, you know what I mean? A common myth oft heard amongst the ignorant claims that Aegon Targaryen had never set foot upon the soil of Westeros until the day he set sail to conquer it. But this cannot be true. Years before that sailing, the painted table had been carved and decorated at Lord Aegon's command, a massive slab of wood some 15 feet, uh, 50 feet long carved in the shape of Westeros and painted to show all the woods and rivers and towns and castles of the Seven Kingdoms. Plainly, 
Aegon's interest in Westeros long predated the events that drove him to war. As well, there are reliable poor reports of Aegon and his sister Visenya visiting the citadel of Old Town in their youth and hawking on the arbor as guests of Lord Redwain. He may have visited Lannisport as well. Accounts differ. The Westeros of Aegon's youth was divided into seven quarrelsome kingdoms, and there was hardly a time when two or three of these kingdoms were not at war with one another. The vast, cold, stormy north was ruled by the Starks of Winterfell. In the deserts of Dorne, the Martell princes held sway. The gold, rich Westerlands were ruled by the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, the fertile reach by the gardeners of High Garden, the Vale, the Fingers, and the Mountains of the Moon belonged to House Arryn. But the most belligerent kings of Aegon's time were the two whose realm lay closest to Dragonstone, Harren the Black and Argilac the Arrogant. Maybe that's right, Argilac, Argilac, I don't know. From their great citadel, Storm's End, the Storm Kings of House Durandon had once ruled the eastern half of Westeros from Cape Wrath to the Bay of Crabs. It's a little bit noisy outside. It's literally like 11 p.m. There's nothing I can do, I'm sorry. But their powers have been dwindling for centuries. The kings of the Reach had nibbled at their domains from the west. The Dornishmen harassed them from the south. The Heron and Heron the Black and his Iron Men had pushed them from the Trident. King Argalak, last of the Durandon, had arrested this decline for a time, turning back a Dornish invasion whilst still a boy, crossing the narrow sea to join the Great Alliance against the imperialist tigers of Volantis. Excuse me, I lost my place. And slaying Gars, the seventh gardener, king of the Reach, in the Battle of Summerfield 20 years later. But Argalak had grown older, his famous mane of black hair had gone gray, and his prowess at arms had faded. North of the Blackwater, the Riverlands were ruled by the bloody hand of Heron the Black of House Hor. Hoar? I don't know. <laughs> king of the Isles and the Rivers. It's different when you're actually reading it rather than speaking out loud. You don't have to worry about pronunciation. Uh, Harren's ironborn grandsire, Harwin Hardhand, had taken the trident from Argilac's grandsire, Eric, whose own forebears had thrown down the last of the River Kings centuries earlier. Harren's father had extended his domains east to Duskendale and Rosby. Harden, uh, Har Harren himself had devoted most of his long reign, close on 40 years, to building a gigantic castle beside the god's eye. But with Heron Hall at the last nearing completion, the Ironborn would soon be free to fresh conquests. No king in Westeros was more feared than Black Heron, whose cruelty had become legendary all throughout the Seven Kingdoms. And no king in Westeros felt more threatened than Argilac, the Storm King, last of the Durandon, an aging warrior whose only heir was his maiden daughter. Thus, it was that King Argilac reached out to the Targaryens on Dragonstone, offering Lord Aegon his daughter in marriage, with all the lands east of the gods, eye from the trident to the Blackwater Rush as her dowry. Aegon Targaryen spurned the Storm King's proposal. He had two wives, he pointed out. He did not need a third, of course not. He got two already, right? And the downer, uh, the dower lands being offered, had belonged to Heron Hall for more than a generation. They were not Argilacs to give. I really hope I'm saying this guy's name right, by the way, because if I'm not, I've been butchering his name for like almost 15 minutes. <laughs> Plainly, the aging Storm King meant to establish the Targaryens along the Blackwater as a buffer between his own lands and those of Heron the Black. The Lord of Dragonstone countered with an offer of his own. He would take the dower lands being offered if Argilac would also cede uh, Macy's Hook and the woods and plains from the Blackwater south to the river Windwater and the headwaters of the Mander. The pact would be sealed by the marriage of Argilac's daughter to Oris Baratheon, Lord Aegon's childhood friend and champion. These terms Argilac the Arrogant rejected angrily. 
Horus Baratheon was a base-born half-brother to Lord Aegon. It was whispered, and the Storm King would not dishonor his daughter by giving her hand to a bastard. The very suggestion enraged him. Argalak had the hands of Aegon's en envoy cut off and returned to him in a box. These are the only hands your bastard shall ever have of me, he wrote. Aegon made no reply. Instead, he summoned his friends, bannermen, and principal allies to attend him on Dragonstone. Their numbers were small. The Valerians of Driftmark were sworn to House Targaryen, as were the Celtigars of Claw Isle. From Macy's Hook came Lord, uh, Lord Bar Emmon of Sharp Point and Lord Macy of Stone Dance, both sworn to Storm's End, but with closer, closer ties to Dragonstone. Lord Aegon and his sisters took counsel with them and visited the castle, sept to pray to the Seven of Westeros as well, though he had never been accounted uh, a pious man. On the seventh day, a cloud of ravens burst from the towers of Dragonstone to bring Lord Aegon's word to the seven kingdoms of Westeros. To the seven kings they flew to the citadel of Old Town. To lords, both great and small, all carried the same message. From this day forth, there would be one king in Westeros. Those who bent the knee to Aegon of House Targaryen would keep their lands and titles. Those who took up arms against him would be thrown down, humbled, and destroyed. A little extreme. Accounts differ on how many swords set sail from Dragonstone with Aegon and his sisters. Some say 3,000. Other numbers, them only in the hundreds. This modest Targaryen host put ashore at the mouth of the Blackwater Rush on the northern bank where three wooded hills rose above a small fishing village. In the days of the Hundred Kingdoms, many petty kings had claimed dominion over the river mouth. Amongst them, the Darkland kings of Duskendale, the Macy's of Stone Dance, and the River Kings of Old. Be they muds, fissures, brackens, blackwoods, or hooks, towers, and forts had crowned the three hills at various times, only to be thrown down in one war or another. Now, only broken stones and overgrown ruins remained to welcome the Targaryens. Though claimed by Storm's End and Harrenhal, the river mouth was undefended and the closet castles were held by lesser lords of no great power or military prowess. And lords, moreover, who had little reason to love their nominal overlord, Heron the Black. Agard and Targaryen quickly threw up a, lo uh, a log and earth palisade around the highest of three hills, of the three hills, and dispatched his sisters to secure the submission of the nearest castles. Rosby yielded to Rhaenys and golden-eyed Maraxus without a fight. At Stokeworth, a few crossbowmen loosed bolts at Visenya until Vagar's flames set the roofs of the castle keep ablaze. They then too submitted. The Conqueror's first true test came from Lord Darklin of Duskendale and Lord Mut Mutoon of Maidenpool who joined their power and marched south with 3,000 men to drive the invaders back into the sea. Aegon sent Oris Baratheon out to attack them on the march, whilst he descended on them from above with the Black Dread. Both lords were slain in, one, in the one-sided battle that followed. Darklet's son and M Matun's brother thereafter yielded up their castles and swore their swords to House Targaryen. At that time, Duskendale was the principal Westerosi port on the Narrow Sea and had grown fat and wealthy from the trade that passed through its harbor. Visenya Targaryen did not allow the town to be sacked, but she did not hesitate to claim its riches, greatly swelling the coffers of the conquerors. This perhaps would be an apt place to discuss the differing characters of Aegon Targaryen and his sisters and queens. Visenya, eldest of the three siblings, was as much a warrior as Aegon himself. A comfortable, uh, as comfortable in ring mail as in silk. She carried the Valerian longsword Dark Sister and was skilled in its use, having trained beside her, trained beside her brother since childhood. Though possessed of the silver gold hair and purple eyes of Valeria, she, hers was a harsh austere beauty. Austere? I think it's austere. Even those who loved her best found Visenya stern, serious, and unforgiving. Some said that she played with poisons and dabbled in dark sorceries. Rhaenys, youngest of the three Targaryens, was all her sister was not. 
playful, curious, impulsive, given to flights of fancy. No true warrior, Rainus loved music, dancing, and poetry, and supported many a singer, mummer, and puppeteer. Yet it was said that Rainus spent more time on Dragonback than her brother and sister combined, for above all these things, she loved to fly. She once was heard to say that she that before she died, she meant to fly Maraxis across the Sunset Sea to see what lay upon its western shores. Whilst no one ever questioned Visenya's fidelity to her brother-husband, Rena surrounded herself with comely young men, and it was whispered, even entertained some in her bedchambers. On the nights when Aegon was with her elder sister, Yet despite these rumors, observers at court could not fail to note that the king spent nights, uh, ten nights, with Rhaenys for every night with Visenya. Aegon Targaryen himself, strangely, was as much an enigma to his temporaries as to us. Armed with the Valerian steel blade Blackfire, he was counted amongst the greatest warriors of his age. Yet he took no pleasure in feats of arms and never rode in tourney or melee. His mount was... Valerian the Black Dread, but he flew only to battle or to travel swiftly across land and sea. His commanding presence drew men to his banners, yet he had no close friends, save Oris Baratheon, the companion of his youth. Women were drawn to him, but Aegon remained ever faithful to his sisters. As king, he put great trust in his small council and his sisters, leaving much of the day-to-day -day governance of the realm to them. Yet he did not hesitate to take command when he found it necessary, though he dealt harshly with rebels and traitors. He was open-handed with former foes who bent the knee. This was showed for the first time at Aegonfort, the crude wood and earth castle he had raised atop uh, what would henceforth and forever be known as Aegon's High Hill, having taken a dozen castles and secured the mouth of the black water rush on both sides of the river. He commanded the lords he had defeated to attend him. There they laid their swords at his feet, and Aegon raised them up and confirmed them in their lands and titles. To his oldest supporters he gave new honors. Damon Valerian, lord of the tides, was made master of the ships in command of the royal fleet. Tristan Macy, lord of Stone Dance, was named master of the laws. Crispin Celtigar, Master of Coin, and Oris Baratheon, he proclaimed to be my shield, my steward, stalwart, my strong right hand. Thus, Baratheon is recognized by the maesters, the first king's hand. Heraldic banners had long been a tradition amongst the lords of Westeros, but such had never been used by the dragon lords of old Valeria. When Aegon's knights unfurled his great silken battle standard with a red three-headed dragon breathing fire upon a black field, the lords took it for a sign that he was now truly one of them, a worthy high king for Westeros. When King Visenya, Queen Visenya, excuse me, placed a Valyrian steel circlet studded with rubies on her brother's head, and Queen Rhaenys hailed him as Aegon, first of his name, king of all Westeros and shield of his people, the dragons roared, and the lords and knights sent up a cheer. But the small folk, the fishermen, and the field hands and good wives shouted loudest of all. The seven kings that Aegon the dragon meant to uncrown were not cheering, however. In Harren Hall, the Storm's End and Storm's End, Harren the Black and Argilac the Arrogant had already called their banners. In the west, King Myrn of the Reach rode the ocean north, uh, to Casterly Rock to meet with King Loren of House Lannister. The Princess of Dorne dispatched Raven to Dragonstone, offering to join Aegon against Argilac, the Storm King, but as an equal and an ally, not a subject. Another offer of alliance came from the Boy King of the Eyrie, Ronell Arryn, whose mother asked for all the lands east of the Green Fork of the Trident for the Vale's support against Black Heron. Even in the north, King Torrin Stark of Winterfell sat with his lords, bannermen, and councils, councillors late into the night, discussing what has to be done with his would-be conqueror. The whole realm waited anxiously to see where Aegon would move next. Within days of his coronation, Aegon's armies were on the march again. The greater part of his host crossed the Blackwater Rush, making south for Storm's End, 
under the command of Oris Baratheon. Queen Renus accompanied him, aside astride Maraxis of the Golden Eyes and Silver Scales. The Targaryen fleet under Daemon Valathian, Baratheon, Valerian, excuse me, I am tired from reading. You know, let me just say, not to break up the story, but I'm only on page 12. It is much harder to read this out loud than it is to just like read it normally. I would have sped through this by now. But anyway, the Targaryen fleet under Daemon Valerian left Blackwater Bay and turned north for Goldtown and the Bale. With them went Queen Visenya and Vagar, Vagar. The king himself marched northwest to the God's Eye and Harrod Hall, the gargantuan fortress that was the pride and obsession of King Harren the Black. All three Targaryens, uh, Targaryen thrusts faced fierce opposition. Lords Errol Fell and Buckler, Bannerman to Storm's End, surprised the advanced elements of Oris Baratheon's host as they were crossing the Wendwater cutting down more than a thousand men before fading back into the trees. A hastily assembled Aran fleet, augmented by a dozen Bravosi warships, met and defeated the Targaryen fleet in the waters of Gulltown. Amongst the dead was Aegon's, Aegon's admiral, Daemon Valerian. Aegon himself was at, attacked on the south shore of the God's Eye, not once, but twice. The Battle of the Reeds was a Targaryen victory, but they suffered heavy losses at the Wailing Willows when two of King Harren's sons crossed the lake in longboats with muffled oars and fell upon their rear. In the end, though, Aegon's enemies had no answer for his dragons. The men of the Vale sank a third of the Targaryen ships and captured near as many, but when Queen Visenya descended upon them from the sky, their own ships burned. Lords Errol, Fell, and Buckler hid in their familiar forests until Queen Rhaenys unleashed Maraxis in a wall of fire, swept through the woods, turning the trees to torches, and the victors at the Wailing Willows returned across the lake to Harren Hall, where uh, were ill prepared when Balerion fell upon them out of the morning sky. Harren's longboats burned, so did Harren's sons. Aegon's foes also found themselves plagued by other enemies. As Argilac the Arrogant gathered his swords at Storm's End, pirates from the Stepstones descended on the shores of Cape Wrath to take advantage of their absence. And Dornish raiding parties came boiling out of the Red Mountains to sweep across the marches. In the Vale, young King Ronel had, had to contend with a rebellion on the Three Sisters when the Sistermen renounced all allegiance to Aerie and proclaimed, proclaimed Lady Marla Sunderland their queen. Yet these were but minor vexations compared to what befell Heron the Black. And my friends, I am thinking that this might be it as this is quite a long chapter, so I'm going to have to leave you on that cliffhanger. Um, we've got another like 15 pages to read for this chapter and the way that I'm reading at this rate, it's going to take me another hour, maybe 30, 35, 40, maybe an hour, you know, so I might have to call it here, but if you like this video, let me know. We can do a part two. I hope that you're enjoying the newest season of House of Dragon. As you guys know, if you can see in the background, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan, so for me, this has been an awesome experience to finally get Game of Thrones back on television. I know it left a bad taste in everyone's uh, collective mouths with the last season, myself included. So to see how well House of Dragon is doing and how good it actually is really does put a smile on my face. And now the next step is while the show goes on hiatus for two years is I'm going to read all of the Game of Thrones books and basically get my fix for the next two years because there's enough books for me to really entertain myself so thank you all for tuning in and if you're interested in reading the books yourselves again you can start with the main series if you'd like um, if you want to go back in chronological order timeline wise you can get fire and blood and start with this it's a good book thumbnail perhaps maybe i don't know um but yeah, Fire and Blood, check it out. Um, thank you all 
for tuning in to this video. I love you all. I know sometimes I don't upload as often as I should. Life comes at you fast. It comes at you hard. And sometimes things kind of put you off balance a little bit and you're not in the right mental space to make videos, you know? So I'm here, I'm back. I'm gonna put out content as I've always said since I started this channel in 2017. So fear not, I'm here and I love you all. Good night.